Welcome to Pals, it's Prof. Sanyamu's Anatomy Lecture Series. In this place, our goal is to make anatomy simple. If you're just joining us, or you have not subscribed, we would love you to please do and be part of this amazing anatomy family. In today's lecture, we'll be discussing the prevertebral and paravertebral regions of the neck and also root of the neck. The lecture is divided into three parts. In the first part, which you're watching, we'll first identify which areas of the neck are called prevertebral and paravertebral regions. We will then determine their extent, identify the muscles within the regions. We will also look at the features of each of the muscles, the origin, insertion, innervation, and action. We will go ahead and locate the region called root of the neck, identify the boundaries, structures within this region, and some intermuscular spaces or triangles. In the part 2 of the lecture, we will briefly look at some of the major structures within the root of the neck, like the arteries, the veins, and the nerves. Finally, in part 3, which is the last part, we will consider clinical anatomy of the entire region studied, and we will test our knowledge of what we have learned in all the parts through our question and answer section where we will answer related questions from various examination boards. So sit tight, let's go to class. We will start with the prevertebral region. This is the prevertebral region. It is basically the region anterior to the cervical vertebra. This region extends from first cervical vertebra here to the upper two thoracic vertebra here. Covering this region are muscles called prevertebral muscles. These are the prevertebral muscles. These muscles are also called anterior vertebral muscles because they all lie in front of the cervical part of the vertebral column. All of them are covered by prevertebral fascia. They are supplied by ventral rami of cervical nerves. They form the posterior boundary of the retropharyngeal space. And as a group, they flex the neck and also flex the head on the neck. These muscles are four in number and are 1. Rectus capitis anterior, Rectus capitis lateralis, Longus cervicis, and longus capitis. This is the rectus capitis anterior. Let's have a closer view. It picks origin from the lateral mass of the atlas, which we know is the first cervical vertebra. This is the atlas, and this point is the lateral mass, which forms the point of origin of the rectus capitis anterior. This muscle from this point of origin runs upwards and a little medially to insert on the basic occiput. This is the base of the skull and here is the basic occiput. It is the part of occipital bone lying anterior to the foramen magnum and occipital condyle. Innervation of this muscle is from the ventral ramus of C1 spinal nerve. Actions of the muscle flexion, specifically anterior flexion of the head, as you can see in the illustration. This is rectus capitis. Let us also take a closer view. It picks origin from the upper transverse process of the atlas. This is the atlas vertebra, and this is the upper surface of the transverse process. From here, it runs upwards and laterally to insert on the inferior surface of the jugular process of the septal bone. Here also is the base of the skull. And this point is the inferior surface of the jugular process of the septal bone. This muscle is innervated by ventral ramus of C1 spinal nerve. And the action is lateral flexion of the head to the same side, as you can also see in the illustration. 
Here again is the Longus coli, also called Longus cervices. It is the longest and most medial of the prevertebral muscles. It extends from the anterior tubercle of Atlas here down to the anterior aspect of the body of third thoracic vertebra here. This muscle is made up of three parts. The upper oblique part, the middle vertical part, and the lower oblique part. We will start with the upper oblique part. This part picks origin from the anterior tubercles of the transverse processes of C3, C4, and C5 vertebra. Here is a typical cervical vertebra, and this is the transverse process. This is a posterior tubercle of the transverse process, and here is the anterior tubercle of the transverse process, where the muscle picks origin from. It then passes upward and medially to insert on the anterior arch of the atlas. Now the middle part. This peaks origin from the front of bodies of T3, T2, T1, and also C7 to C5 vertebra. The fibers then move up to be inserted on the front of the bodies of the second, third, and fourth cervical vertebra. Here is the inferior oblique part. It is the smallest part. It also runs obliquely like the first part. It picks origin from the front of the bodies of the T3 to T1 vertebra here. It then runs upwards and laterally to be inserted on the anterior tubercles of the transverse processes of the fifth and sixth cervical vertebra. Innervation of longus coli muscle is through the anterior primary rami of C2 to C6 spinal nerves. This muscle is involved in anterior flexion of the neck. Two, with the upper oblique part acting alone, it brings about lateral flexion. Three, with the lower oblique part acting alone, it brings about rotation of neck to the opposite side. This is the longus capitis. It arises from the anterior tubercles of the transverse processes of C3 to C6 vertebra. It now ascends to get inserted into the inferior surface of basilar part of occipital bone here, along the side of pharyngeal tubercle. Its innervation is from the branches of anterior primary rami of the upper four cervical spinal nerves, which are C1 to C4. The action is flexion of head. We will now consider the paravertebral region. It is the region of the neck immediately lateral to the cervical vertebra. The muscles in this region are called paravertebral muscles or lateral vertebral muscles. This region extends from the first cervical vertebra down to the upper two ribs. This region lies under cover of stenocleidomastoid muscle and the muscles are covered by prevertebral layer of the deep cervical fascia. Their innervation is from the anterior rami of the cervical spinal nerves. The vertebral muscles are made up of one, scalenus anterior here, scalenus medius behind, and scalenus posterior, most posteriorly. Here is scalenus posterior. It is the smallest and most deeply situated muscle in this group. It picks origin from the posterior tubercles of the transverse processes of C4 to C6 vertebra. It moves inferiorly and laterally to insert on the outer surface of the second rib here. This is behind the tubercle for serratus anterior. Here is the tubercle of serratus anterior. Innervation of this muscle is from the anterior primary rami of lower three cervical spinal nerves, which are C6, C7, and C8. The action is lateral flexion of the neck, 
And by virtue of its attachment to the second rib, it also elevates the rib, thereby acting as an accessory muscle of respiration. This is scalenus medius. It lies between the scalenus anterior and scalenus posterior. It is the longest and largest of all the scaling muscles. Its origin is from the posterior tubercles and costal transverse bars of the transverse processes of C2 to C6 vertebra. It then runs inferiorly and laterally to be inserted on the upper surface of the first rib between the tubercle of the rib and the groove for subclavian artery. Its innervation is from the anterior primary rami of C3 to C8 spinal nerves. The actions are 1. Lateral flexion of the neck 2. By virtue of its attachment on the first rib, it is able to elevate the first rib when the upper attachment is fixed, thus acting also as an accessory muscle of respiration. This is the scalenus anterior. It is the most superficial in this group. It lies deep to stenocleidomastoid muscle. It is actually a key muscle at the root of the neck, and this is as a result of its intimate relations to many structures in this region. It therefore serves as a useful surgical landmark. Its origin is from the anterior tubercle of the transverse processes of all the typical cervical vertebrae, and by this we are referring to the C3 to C6 vertebra. It then runs downwards and laterally to be inserted on the scaling tubercle of the first rib. This is a tubercle seen on the inner border of the first rib. The innervation of this muscle is from the anterior primary rami of C4 to C6 spinal nerves. The actions are 1. Flexion of the neck and by virtue of its attachment on the first rib, it is able to elevate the rib, thereby also acting as accessory muscle of respiration. Now we are ready to look at the root of the neck. This region is the junctional area between the thorax and the neck. It is the area of the neck immediately above the superior thoracic aperture through which structures pass between the thorax, neck, and upper limb. It is surrounded by the following structures. Anteriorly, we have the manubrium of the sternum. Posteriorly, we have the body of T1 vertebra. And laterally, we have the first pair of ribs and the costal cartilages. Earlier in our lecture, we have noted that the skeleton anterior plays a key role in relating with the positions of the rest of the structures in the root of the neck. We will consider those positions in this section. Anteriorly, we have the following structures relating to the scalenus anterior. One nerve, that's phrenic nerve. Two arteries, suprascapular artery and transverse cervical artery. Two veins, anterior jugular vein and subclavian vein. Two muscles, inferior belly of homohyoid and clavicular head of stenocleidomastoid. We also have the carotid sheath and clavicle bone. Posteriorly, we have root of brachial plexus, second part of subclavian artery, scalenus medius, and an intermuscular space called scaling triangle. We also have cervical pleura and suprapleural membrane covering the apex of the lungs. Media to scalenus anterior is a scalenovertebral triangle and its contents. And laterally, we see the trunks of brachial plexus as they merge underneath it. And finally, superiorly, we see the longus capitis muscle and the ascending cervical artery. One of the intermuscular spaces behind 
the scalene's anterior is the scalene triangle. This is a region of the scalene triangle. It is also called the subclavian triangle. It is one of the intermuscular spaces within the region of the root of the neck and it is located between two scalene muscles, the scalenus anterior and the scalenus medius. Let us look at the boundaries. Anteriorly, we have the scalenus anterior, posteriorly, the scalenus medius. The apex is formed by the junction of the anterior and posterior border superiorly, and the base is formed by the first rib. The contents are trunks of brachial plexus and subclavian artery. One of the structures that could, that could bring narrowing of this space and compression of the content within it is the cervical rib. A cervical rib is an abnormal rib formed when the costal elements of the seventh cervical vertebra undergo abnormal development to form a rib. This abnormal rib will usually arise from the antrotubercle of the transverse process of the seventh cervical vertebra. This rib may have a free anterior end. It may also be connected to the first rib by a fibrous band, or it may even just articulate with the first rib. Complete cervical rib passes right through the scalene triangle, running between the scalenus anterior and scalenus medius to reach the first rib close to the insertion of scalenus anterior. Most of the times, it occurs unilaterally and usually occurs on the right side. Its presence in the scalene triangle is one of the triggers of a condition known as scalene syndrome. Scalene syndrome is a group of signs and symptoms produced due to compression of the main structures within the scalene triangle. This compression comes as a result of narrowing of this space following the presence of cervical rib or due to spasm of scalene muscles. Clinically, this syndrome presents as follows. 1. Tingling sensation and numbness along the inner border of forearm and hand, which is actually along the distribution of C8 and T1 spinal nerve, which is the lower trunk that is trapped within the space. 2. Progressive paresis and wasting of intrinsic muscles of the hand. This is also because most of these muscles are supplied by the C8 and T1 spinal nerves. And number three, ischemic pain and absence of radial pulse due to compression of subclavian artery. An intermuscular space is also seen on the medial side of scalenus anterior. This intermuscular space is called the scalenovertebral triangle or triangle of vertebral artery. This space is deeply placed and has the following boundaries. Medially, we see the inferior oblique part of the longus coli. Laterally, we have the medial border of scalenus anterior. The apex is formed by the transverse process of C6 vertebra. The base is formed by the first part of subclavian artery. The floor is formed by the following. 1. The transverse process of C7 vertebra 2. Ventral ramus of C8 spinal nerve 3. Neck of first rib and 4. The dome of cervical pleura as it lines the apex of the lungs. The roof is formed by the carotid sheath. The contents include first part of vertebral artery, thyrocervical trunk, inferior thyroid artery, sympathetic chain with stellate ganglion, and answer subclavia. This is a nerve loop that connects the middle and inferior cervical ganglia and also passes around the subclavian artery. This is where we will end the first part of this lecture.
If you have questions, comments, or suggestions, please drop them in the comment section. We will be happy to have them. In the part 2 of this lecture, we will briefly look at some of the major structures within the root of the neck, like the arteries, the veins, and the nerves. The part 3 will consider the clinical anatomy of this region, we will also test our knowledge of all we've learned in the various parts through MCQ questions, where we we'll answer related questions from various examination boards. If you have not subscribed, please do it now. And if you like the video, like it and share it to your friends that will need it. And together, we will build a unique anatomy family where we make anatomy simple. See you in my next video. And bye for now.